All the combinations that we've dealt with up till now have been pairwise. That is, one atomic orbital on atom one combines with another atomic orbital on atom two. But here, what we're going to see is we can go beyond simple pairwise combinations. We're going to make molecular orbitals that are a little bit of this and a little bit of that. In fact, we're going to construct sigma sp orbitals that are mixtures of four atomic orbitals, taking smaller portions of those atomic orbitals. That's what you can see in this equation here, where the new molecular orbital, which is represented sigma sp, includes a little bit of 2s atom a, a here stands for oxygen, 2s atom b, and then it also includes the 2p combinations from a and b. The weighting factors that are out in front, these coefficients, are going to be some number that basically tells how much each of those different atomic orbitals contribute to that molecular orbital. And so rather than using simply pairs of atomic orbitals, now we're going to use portions of four atomic orbitals to produce a molecular orbital. Now the exact numbers, we won't be able to predict what those values are, but we can at least qualitatively understand which atomic orbitals make the greatest contribution to the molecular orbital. And we can do that by looking at what's the best energy matched case. And we know that for sigma sp, the best matched case would be the 2px on oxygen and the 2s on carbon. Okay, so we'll put dashed lines to signify those important contributions, the, matched, the best matched case to uh, those sigma bonding and antibonding contributions. However, there are secondary interactions that also contribute, and those secondary interactions are, are shown here. And I can give you some illustrative numbers that describe what I mean by the primary and secondary contributions. And these numbers are, again, just for illustrative purposes. They're not exact. But how is the 2px on oxygen proportioned to the molecular orbitals, the three molecular orbitals that, that it contributes to? So maybe it makes a contribution of 45%. 45% of that 2px uh, goes there. 50% uh, goes to the bond, anti-bonding contribution. And that leaves 5% for the sigma p star. 95% of the 2s makes the sigma s bonding contribution. And that leaves 5% left over that can go into the sigma sp. So you can see that in each of these cases, we've consumed 100% of the atomic orbitals, and we've fed that contribution into molecular orbitals. So uh, down here, sigma s was made up of 95% from the oxygen 2s. That would leave 5% that could come from the uh, carbon 2s. And so if we keep going, 50, 45, and let's say actually 0 here, 5%. And that would give us 95%. So these numbers illustrate all of the ways that the atomic orbitals proportion themselves into the molecular orbitals. You can see that for any molecular orbital that results, it's a fully formed orbital. It receives 100% uh, contribution from the different atomic orbitals. In the case of sigma p star, we wrote it down as 5 and 95%. In the case of the sigma sp star, it was 50%. 45 and 5%. And so we've contributed 100% to each of those molecular orbitals. And so there's all of the atomic orbitals contributions going out and divvied up, and the molecular orbitals likewise receive those contributions in varying proportions. I'd like to very quickly give you an alternative explanation of how we could take that fluorine diagram and come up with a similar uh, scheme. And this is also useful because it will show us the relationship between what changes in that original fluorine diagram and, and what doesn't. And again, it's qualitative and it's approximate. But we could mix molecular orbitals if they're able to be blended because their symmetries are the same. And the symmetry of sigma p has cylindrical symmetry, and sigma s star has cylindrical symmetry. So we could take those newly formed molecular orbitals and remix them like we always do when two molecular orbitals or two atomic orbitals combine. And here's their levels when we say that sigma s p x mixing is negligible. But then when we turn on sigma s p mixing, um, we end up we allow those to mix, and we produce sigma sp, a new sigma sp. I call it L for lowered and R for raised. When we start mixing these orbitals, ideas of bonding and anti-bonding become a little bit difficult to define. And so I just simply say L and R there. So what's the result of sp mixing? 
Well, uh, most things don't change in this diagram. All the pi levels stay exactly the same. They weren't involved in SP mixing. This sigma p star wasn't really very close to the uh, other sigma p and sigma s star, so it wasn't involved in mixing. Similarly, that energy doesn't change for the sigma s. It's very far away, and it doesn't get involved in sp mixing. It's only these two that change their position, sigma p and sigma s star. So what happens? Well, we already know one drops down in energy, so if we just come over, notice that one of the levels has risen above the pi's and is in between pi and pi star, and the other level drops below that. So when we put those into place, We've got the sigma sp, it's slightly below the 2s level. We've got a sigma sp, and I'll call it an anti-bonding sigma sp, that we raised, and it went above the pi level. And when we combine those with their major atomic contributors, we end up with that diagram. And we know that there's these secondary contributors as well, and that's essentially then the molecular orbital diagram of carbon monoxide.